Welcome. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino in particular, thank you for coming out tonight. I see we have a centrist crowd tonight. That's, we'll see if that holds true. Uh, thank you for our, coming to our first Brookings Scholar Lecture uh, of the semester. We're speaking on an important topic tonight and we have a, a roster of our lectures out front. If you leave us your email, you can follow us on social media as well and, uh, and to uh, hear what we're up to throughout the semester and the year. Let me also thank our colleagues at Greenspun College, uh, particularly the students and faculty who are helping us record the lecture tonight. It'll be up on our website in a few days, as will the PowerPoint. Uh, so you'll be able to YouTube and see if they caught you in the audience. Uh, it'll, uh, they also get shown on local public television at all uh, strange hours of the day. So you can, uh, your friends can catch us there as well. Uh, we're thrilled to have our colleague Aaron Klein out for his first official visit from Brookings. Aaron's going to speak on uh, credit cards and uh, payment uh, issues, uh, a critical problem for our nation here in Nevada and in Las Vegas in particular, uh, and for many of us individually, uh, I, I would su uh, suggest. Uh, so I hope, I hope you'll have your questions and comments for Aaron as he delves into this topic. Our state legislature recently took a stab at it. I would argue they didn't quite get where they might have, but we may have some advice for them tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about Aaron. He is a fellow in economic studies at Brookings, where he serves as policy director of the Center on Regulation and Markets. He focuses on financial regulation and technology, macroeconomics, and infrastructure finance and policy. Uh, prior to joining Brookings, he directed the Bipartisan Poly Center's Finance Regulatory Platform Initiative, and he also served in the Treasury Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. So as you can imagine, our students and faculty have enjoyed uh, his perspective both <coughs> on what the federal government is doing and not doing, and what they should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, Aaron is a graduate of Dartmouth College and also the Woodrow Wilson School for Public Affairs at Princeton University. And as soon as his microphone is ready, I'll invite him to come on up and start the evening for us. Aaron? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. I want to start by thanking Bill and Robin and Caitlin for hosting me for a wonderful week. I've had a fantastic time at, in Nevada. Uh, and uh, uh, at UNLV it's, and Brookings Mountain West, it's a fantastic environment. I've learned a lot and had some great privilege of talking and, and uh, answering questions with many of you in the room already in different classroom settings. Uh, please, I want this to be an interactive lecture. If I use an acronym, stop me. Raise your hand. If you have a question, if something triggers something, I hope I use that on a college campus properly, it triggers a thought, an idea, a debate. Raise your hand, let's have a conversation about this. Because one of the things, you know, I spent a career in financial services and financial policy. Uh, uh, you know, I helped work on a lot of big pieces of complex macroeconomic financial stability, bank regulation and prudential macroeconomics. I'm not here to talk to you about that tonight because it's big and it's esoteric. What I'm here to talk to you about is this thing that we all use called the payment system that has silently become a giant reverse Robin Hood to deal with what I think is the most critical issue facing our nation and our economy and our society, which is the radical growth of income inequality. And what we don't, I think, fully understand and appreciate is we have this silent sucking sound taking billions of dollars a year out of the pockets of people working paycheck to paycheck and redistributing them aggressively to those who are extremely wealthy, and we all participate in it. And there are a series of simple policy solutions that I don't know if they're liberal or conservative ideas. I know they don't necessarily involve taxing and spending. Uh, and I think we all ought to be able to agree that we can fix these problems. And I'll show you exactly how and which other countries have and why they're so critically important. Uh, 
And so with that in mind, let me first set the stage a little bit about our nation's income inequality because I'd like to think whether, however much redistribution you want to do, I'd like to think that we can agree on a couple premises, which is the payment system should not be a tool to take from those with less money and give to those with more. It should be a bit much more, whether you want to tilt it in which direction, but it shouldn't be tilted in the direction that it is. And so imagine, if you will, America has 320 million people. Line them up from the richest, Jeff Bezos, to the poorest. And to give you an idea about how that line would look today, if you took the three richest individuals, right, Bezos, Gates, and Buffett, and you put them on one side, and this is all their money, in order to balance the teeter-totter for the, on the other side, starting at the poor, bottom, you would have to take 160 million Americans, in other words, half the country, and add up all of their wealth to balance the side of the three richest people. I didn't say the 10, the 20, the 500, the top three. That's how skewed our income distribution system is today. And what's interesting is the payment system is preying on that bottom half. And it's that large, 160 million people. Uh, and I'm going to go how, and I'm going to talk about how, and there are two different aspects of it. The first is actually how we physically pay for things. And the second is how long it takes for payments to clear. And the policy solutions in the issues are different, but they both have the same effect of this scale. And I'm going to start with the one that we're much more used to, which is how we pay for things. All right? This is, right, you got cash or credit. It's a little more complicated than that. There's debit, which has grown a lot. There's electronic, ACH, you do, that's not Apple Pay. Apple Pay is just your credit card in a phone format. Right? What electronic would be like a bank wire transfer, right? like an automatic bill pay if you ever do that online sometimes where they take the little routing number, right? which, isn't, which isn't a check. We used to have checks. People, I, I do this talking, people go, oh, cash is going away. How many people have cash, uh, particularly on college campuses? And I said, well, you know what, actually, how you pay for something is deeply correlated with your income and how much something is, costs. And cash is very prevalently used. So under $10, about half of all transactions are cash. Two thirds of the time for this subset of things that we all basically buy daily necessities. Why? Because basically, you know, food and uh, you know, shampoo. Rich people use about as much shampoo as poor people. They may pay richer, you know, fancier brands or whatever. But when you're dealing with more staples and lower income things, these instruments of payment are highly correlated, right? And you go cash, prepaid, debit, credit. And you can correlate it with the value of things purchased, the frequency, or the income of the person who's using it. But remember, cash is still king in how we pay for things, and it's important. Two, how many people here have a prepaid card in their wallet? One. I do. A Starbucks gift card? Two, three? Do I got a couple more? One in ten Americans gets a card. Here is a Starbucks gift card. One out of ten swipes is a prepaid card. Prepaid cards are a very costly way for lower income people to be able to access the value of card networks and not carrying around a lot of cash. And if you think to yourself, you know, gosh, that feels really high. That's, that doesn't feel like me. Go to the store. I took this picture. I didn't have to license it. Think of it. You go to, go, think about Walmart, think about your supermarket. These guys spend a lot of time thinking about shelf space. This is so prevalent. You see those giant racks of all those cards? Somebody's buying them. They're not just out there to be pretty pictures. The people that are buying them are the people who can't, either don't have a bank account or have had enough experience with debit cards being costly to them with overdrafts and other issues that you can't overdraft a prepaid card. It's one of its unique natures. Now, they can have a monthly fee. They can have a fee to check their balance. They can be, they're, they're not cheap to use, but they offer a series of benefits. Uh, they're also a, a cheaper thing for the merchant. And I will get to how much the merchant pays based on what you pay, which is a huge driver here of income inequality. But I want to set the mindset for how people are actually paying for things. This is all a recent phenomenon with, with prepaid. So. Um, this gets to this income correlation here. Lower income people are paying in cash. 
then prepaid, then debit, then credit. Remember that hierarchy, because that hierarchy is very much related to how you pay for something and how much the merchant does. So I'm going to go through an example. Right? If I went and bought something for $10, I'm a good treasury employee, so I always like to use a 10 when I can. Uh, that was my office right there. The, the, uh, the, when I pay for something in $10, the merchant gets $10. All right? Now, reach into the bag of tricks and take out your debit card. Right? Let me find, didn't load up my debit card, right? When you use your debit card, what is the merchant going to, the merchant's going to pay 21 cents. That's a figure the Federal Reserve has put out in regulation as a result of an amendment called the Durbin Amendment. It used to be 39 cents. So they've now received $9.79. Now let's take out a credit card. On a credit card, there may be 30 cents of a swipe fee plus 3% on your credit card. Right? So that's 60 cents in this, uh, I'm sorry, 3 cents, 33 cents in this example. Switch credit cards to the nice, fancy American Express, and now you're up to about 5% in this. Uh, in fact, for smaller item purchases, the fixed fee is much higher. The number one mobile payment app to get around this is Starbucks. It's the most used mobile payment app. Why? You upload 50 bucks once, one swipe fee. 10 cups of coffee at $50. At $5 each, 10 swipe fees. I would guess Starbucks may pay more in swipe fee than coffee. I know my friend has a coffee shop in Maryland does. Let me repeat that. He runs a coffee shop and he pays more in credit card fees for payment processing than he does for purchasing coffee. It's a big cost. But you're the merchant and with a couple exceptions which we can talk about, cash or credit, you charge the same amount, $10, right? So what's happening economically? Is, be, is the people paying cash are paying more. The merchant's getting less for the people who are paying with credit and fancier credit even less. And so there's a cross subsidy. In a truly competitive market, the merchant would either lower the price, be able to lower the price because they're actually receiving less, right? Or price discriminate. In other countries with other contracts, they're able to do that. And in point of fact, they will charge you a surcharge. I noticed here when I, when I took the cab from the airport, there's a credit card surcharge now. And some of the taxis, three bucks. First of all, it's not, even I, who am very aggressive about how much your people are paying, it's more than, it's not three dollars. Nonetheless, what they're pointing out is they're reflecting their actual costs. Yeah, twenty dollar cab ride, you know, fifteen percent they're adding on as a credit card processing charge. So, this is a giant cross subsidy: cash, debit, pre, small cards, fancier cards. Right? In a competitive marketplace. Are you all with me? Right? So the, now I'm going to start talking about the access to this system. Because accessing the higher end cards requires better credit. And who has better credit? People with money. Right? And so this is not fully appreciated even by uh, friends of mine. So I have a colleague, Michael Strain, who does some great research at, at the American Enterprise Institute. He's my frequent Aqua, uh, Octabox sparring partner on CNBC. I'm a big fan of his work and he made a faux pas on Twitter. And I'm going to pick on him for a second even though I want to be very clear for the record. I really respect his research and his work and I'm sure I'm going to make faux pas on Twitter. That's what Twitter's there for. But this um, uh, uh, sociologist professor from Temple started talking about how st students are dropping out of college because they can't access unexpected expenses, right? A parking ticket, a fine. I would actually argue, according to my research, it's more un unanticipated shocks of income. The computer lab where you work was closed for a week or your side job didn't come through and you're struggling to make ends meet. And what he said, can they not get a credit card? This is the modern version of let them eat credit. Because for people with more income, there are no temporal constraints. Credit cards are free and plentiful. They're actually shockingly lucrative, which I'm going to turn to in a second, about how much money wealthy people make off of their credit cards. But the idea, the core nugget of the idea here is this idea that low-income people have the same access to 
what I'd call where in economics liquidity, avoid liquidity constraints, or what we'd all be able to say is handle their money when they get around the zero lower balance of their bank account. Because when you get to the zero lower balance of your bank account, life becomes incredibly expensive incredibly quickly. You are paying a lot of money for things that other people get for free, like credit cards. So let's go into credit cards. This is how people make a lot of money, and it's a very convoluted system. There are three banks and an interchange, a merchant, all this stuff. But the, what I really want you guys to focus on, let me see if I can get the laser point. Right. I want you to focus on this little thing of the dollar. Right. In, this, in this example, there are $5 of fees. They get split a little bit out. The merchant gets 95 of the 100. But in this fee that goes to the credit card, this gets sent back to the consumer as rewards. Who here has a rewards credit card? Right? Anybody here read the points guy? How to maximize your rewards? I'm a Marriott and a Southwest guy. Right? This one dollar or one percent, that's child's play. You can easily get that up to two, uh, depending on how you value or do different things. Where's that coming from? Who's getting that amount of money in order to do that? And it goes with the business model of payment processing. So I'll tell you a story about a company, a little company called American Express. American Express made roughly $7.5 billion last year in profit. 6.1 was from swipe, 1.4 was from interest, from loans. The credit card model, the business model on the high end, is not about what you pay, what running up interest. Pay your balance off every month. A lot of people think, oh, you know. The credit card company isn't making money from me. Oh, they're doing just great. That's why you keep getting offers for more. Why? Because for that $100 that you purchase, you've generated these fees for them, and they're enticing you here. So let's, let's add it up. You got two people. You got a regular person who spends $10,000 a year on their debit card, no rewards on debit. So there used to be some rewards when that fee was higher from 21 to 39. It got lower. They got rid of the rewards because the economics of the system have to work. And you hit the zero lower bound and you kind of hit a couple overdrafts. So the cost of using your payment instrument is negative $150. That's what all of it works. Now, here, a person spent $100,000. Luxury reward, I'm only giving them 1.5%. Again, you can do better if you try. 1500 bucks, but here's another rub. You don't pay taxes. You get that discovered, you get that cash back check. You don't report that on your income. It's actually, there's a technical reason. It's not considered income to you, it's considered a rebate. Rebates are tax free. When you go back into the history as these things started, part of it was they didn't really know how to value how much is a frequent flyer mile worth. Right now you can go online and get a pretty good explanation. They didn't really know how much it was worth and it was going to be complicated. Do you really want to give people 1099s? It was unexpected. And you said, ah, forget about it. 1500 bucks tax free, eh, $2,500, $3,000 of pre tax income. The median American worker makes a little bit over $50,000 a year. In other words, that's two weeks worth of work, pre tax income, on a pre tax income basis, being given in a check back from the payment system to wealthy people. Basically, your two weeks of vacation are going as a freebie. And it's not necessarily a freebie, but it's a reward that's cross-subsidized by all the expenses and the fees and the prices that otherwise would be lower if they were able to price discriminate or if the payment system was just revenue neutral. Hopefully I've convinced you guys this is a pretty big movement here because I tend, even in Washington, policies that get, talk about $2,500 or $3,000 a year of pre-tax earnings or $1,500 a year post-tax. You know, how many of you, you know, a $300 tax refund is a big deal on a national scale. This is, you know, five times that for one group. And the other group's negative 150. So this teeter-totter of income inequality, right, it takes a lot of Joe Sixpacks to fund one Richie Rich, but that's the direction it's going and that's the magnitude. Let me pause questions, comments, reactions. Have I had anybody rethink what they do in their wallet? So, we're, this is going to get worse. 
And it's going to get worse because of a, a Supreme Court case, which didn't get as much media attention as I believe it should have. It's called uh, Ohio v. Amex. It was decided in 2017 by a 5-4 to four vote. It's one of these things where if Merrick Gartland, President Obama's nominee that was unprecedentedly blocked uh, in the Senate in, in 2016, had he been there, probably would have gone 5-4 the other way. But a 5-4 to four vote, the conservative majority sided with American Express. And here's, I'll lay it out for you. It's an antitrust case. And I'm not an antitrust lawyer. But the economics of the case are a little bit simple and the practical. Ohio passed a law that said a merchant could discriminate within American Express and pick which cards to process or not. So American Express has this contract where if you take, if you take any Amex, you have to take them all. Amex has a prepaid card, by the way. It's called a Bluebird. Anybody here have one of those? It's not just, they've, they've diversified their market business. But <clears throat> if you take any Amex, you have to take all. You have to take, because each card has different rewards and different fees. So I can't exactly, it's kind of, those are illustrative graphs. Which card you use in your wallet, the merchant gets slightly different amounts. So it said a merchant could decide. So what would a merchant do? It would probably not take the highest end. It would create some confusion. Amex sued, saying that Ohio lacked that power. And it, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Five to four, the court sided with Amex. The result, if you take one Amex, you have to take them all. So Amex is going to start competing. And you've already seen this. Chase and others, Chase Sapphire, high-end rewards, they're competing and competing for, the, for, for these guys. And in competing for these guys, they're going to keep bumping this number up higher and higher because it's what gets you to switch, what's get you to generate the revenue, which is going to make this get larger and larger. If the court could overturn Amex v. Ohio, you could see something. How big is it? Again, it's a little hard to know because a lot of these agreements are done privately, but there's one company that kind of operates a little differently and it maybe offers you a w window into this. Who here shops at Costco? You guys have got, right? Yeah, yeah, You guys know how Costco only takes Visa. They used to only take American Express. Costco, one of the ways they deliver low prices to you is they more aggressively negotiate their uh, payment usage to drive down their interchange fee. And they pass some of those savings on in cheaper prices or maybe making you buy more bulk than you need. That's a different story. The, uh, um, maybe that's the story of my basement. The, the, the question here is, how much does that matter? Right? Costco, because you have to be a member, brand loyalty, they figure you'd switch. You'd get an Amex if it was that important to you at Costco, or you'd get a Visa. When Costco announced that, Amex's stock fell by 10%. The collective wisdom of the stock market thought that Amex's future profits were that tied when they made that switch. This is big money. And these rewards are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger as a result of this case. Now, I would like to see legislation to overturn Amex v. Ohio or a different Supreme Court. There are other policy solutions that I'll offer. Um, but I want to turn for a moment here, and as I transition from the credit card side of the story, I'm going to turn into the payment side of the story, which ties into payday lending, check cashing, wire transmitter, and how that bottom half that lives paycheck to paycheck that occasionally hits the zero lower bound of their bank account actually lives. So uh, any other questions on credit cards? All right. So about two-thirds of Americans are fully banked. About 7% are unbanked. They don't have a bank account. Right? I want to focus on this group, it's about 20 to 20 5% depending on the survey. They're called underbanking, underbanked. By the way, this title, I want to give credit to Lisa Servan, who's a professor at Penn who wrote a book with this title, which is a fantastic book. What Lisa did is she worked at a check casher for six months. And she did qualitative research as a, uh, in, in uh, Pennsylvania's uh, and published a book on it. It's fantastic and fascinating. Because you ask yourself, if you have a bank account, why are you using a check casher? Why are you getting a payday loan? Why are you getting a wire transmission? This group is three times, more than three times the size of this group. Now, by the way, a little story about payday lending, so we're all in the same knowledge place. Do you know what percent of payday lend borrowers who get a payday loan have a bank account? So I'm flipping the question a little bit. Not what percent of people with bank accounts get payday loans, but what percent of people with, anybody want to take a guess? Bingo. 
It's 100%. It's 100% because to get a payday loan, you have to give them a post-dated check. The percent of people who have a check have to have a bank account. That's how you prove, that's how you get. It's actually your collateral is what I would call a live wire access or a live permission to go into the person's bank account and take the money back at a pre-arranged day. So it's 100%. Payday lending is not a story of these 7% of Americans who don't have bank accounts. And it's not a whoa, 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 whoa. It's not a story of how did that happen? Besides I pushed the wrong button. No, that's that's too far here. Um, so, it is a story of this group, the 20 to 25 percent, thank you very much, Caitlin, is a story of this group, the 20 to 25 percent who are underbanked. And then you have to say, well, why? Why do they use a check casher? Why do they use a payday lender? And I want to tell you how I fell into this research system, because I am not in this group, I'm in the fully banked group. And it's illustrative because I also help it think it helps explain why other people have missed it. The common stories that are told are banks are not conveniently located in your neighborhood. The branch's hours aren't there. The customer can't access it. There's some sort of barrier there. But I'm going to tell you a different story. And it's the story of a Saturday morning that starts out with me taking my two daughters ice skating at our local rink. And after we go ice skating, we go to the local bank, I do my branching, my, my business there. They have a passbook savings account, they get a lollipop, they take their piggy bank savings in. It's kind of financial literacy and human capital development. You know, the bank is a good thing in their mind and they think saving money is, is, is the right way to go. And we're sitting in the bank and there are three people in the bank, myself and two women. One woman's with the teller and, you know, I know the teller, really nice lady. And the woman is getting upset. When's my money going to be available? Thursday? But the check's here. It's, it's good. Well, but I have some debits coming to my account, some bills. What's going to happen? $35? You're going to pay $35? Well, I have more than one. Is it just a flat? $35 per overdraft? What? She's getting mad. You can't do this. It's my money. Here's the check. Here's the check. Here's the check. She's yelling at the teller. Teller's going, you know, what can I do, right? I'm like, this is interesting. The time it takes for them to process this check is causing this mismatch. I'm thinking, huh, well that's kind of interesting. And then the following thing happens. She's not leaving the teller. She's just yelling at the teller. It's one teller on a Saturday morning. We're all standing there. My kids are starting to get antsy. I'm starting to get antsy. The woman in front of me walks up to her, puts her hand on her shoulder and goes, I gotcha. Here's what you do. You leave here, go around to the check casher, get some cash, come back cash, your problem solved. She goes, well, when's the cash going to be in my account? The teller goes, well, that clear, that's in your account immediately. Oh my God, thank you so much. This has been so helpful, blah, blah, And it dawns on me. The check casher is a brilliant idea for it. It's an economically rational decision. Right? That's the other thing you hear. People use check cash. Oh, they really want their money fast. They want to go, you know, the story, go to a casino, right? They want to go party. Well, wait a second. Check cash was 20 bucks. One overdraft is 35. I knew she had more than one. 70. This woman just saved her $50 by going to the check casher to pay $20 to save these couple days. You say to yourself, well, okay, Aaron, that's a, that's a great story. Why have you dedicated the last four years of your life to researching and advocating for real-time payments and payment solutions in America? I say, well, here's a different way to look at that one little anecdote. Three people walk into a bank. There's a person who has this problem a person who knows the answer to this problem, and a third person who thinks he's an expert on banking and payments. That's how prevalent this problem is. Two-thirds of the bank knew the answer. But it was the one-third, let them eat credit, who'd never thought to ask this. By the way, I've been working on payments since 9-11, which changed everybody's life in incalculable ways. But as a little personal aside, I was in the Senate went path. Do you know, before 9-11, um, uh, uh, it was illegal to deposit a picture of your check. How many of you guys have used a remote deposit capture? Right? Take a little picture of your check. So you had to physically present the check. It was part of the law for processing. So a billion dollars a year was spent flying checks all around the country to be physically processed. Bags would be raced out to the airport. 
Well, what happened? Why is 9-11 relevant to this? You guys remember, in 9-11, they stopped flying planes for a week. Nobody could clear payments. The Federal Reserve did some fantastic stuff. I'm going to repeat that. The Federal Reserve did some fantastic stuff, because that's the last time you're going to hear me say that, because I'm about to hammer them <laughs> uh, for what I would consider deep neglect and exacerbating of income inequality in America for failure to do the right thing. But in this time, they did a great thing. And they came running to Congress and they said, look, we don't know now if we're going to be able to. They did a bunch of stuff during the emergency to waive some stuff and, and make the banking system work during 9-11. Imagine if 9-11 and the financial crisis had happened at the same time. Uh, but then they said, look, we have new technology. We can take pictures of this stuff. We can save the environment. We can stop flying checks all around. And who knows if we're going to have this problem again. And Congress worked on something called the Check 21 Act, which I was a lead staffer on in the Senate. And we passed the law. We never in your wildest dreams believed that four years after we passed that bill in 2003, you could take a picture from your phone at home. But we thought ATMs would be able to do it, et cetera, and so forth. So the technology on this stuff has been adapting a lot faster than laws and regulation. Remember that when we get to it. But it's a reminder that the use of this is actually economically rational for a large number of people, right? Three times as many here. The check cashing is not this story. It's this story and why? Payday lending, same issue. She could have gone to the payday lender and gotten money and had it come back. It's starting to click. Now, why does it take four days? Because it used to take four days. It doesn't. It's instant. And um, I'm going to go around. The rest of the world has figured out how to do it immediately a long time ago. Japan started in 1973. Korea got it in 2002. Brazil got it in 2004. There's Mex Mexico, South Africa, England. Sound like if England can do something in 2008, when the first iPhone came out, do you think America could have done it? Do you think we could do it now with an iPhone 10? No, we don't. The entire European Union just went to it in 2017. That's complicated, by the way. To get, to get Latvia and Iceland and, and um, um, Italy and Ireland, Italy, Ireland, um, uh, and all together to interchange in Portugal, all these countries can interchange their payments with legacy systems and all these things, and we can't? Of course we can. We choose not to. And why do we choose not to? I'll tell you why. The Federal Reserve un is the regulator of the nation's payment system, and under the Expedited Funds Availability Act of 1987, Congress said, okay, well, banks can't sit on your money for too long because there used to be a thing called float. Because there used to be a thing called interest. Some of you in the room are old enough to remember that when banks would pay you 10% interest, 12% interest, right? Now people go nuts for 1% or 2%. But people used to think that that money was large dollar amounts and, and um, banks were sitting on it. And in point of fact, they pa passed this law about the maximum number of days, which was three or five, depending on if it was a local or non local check. Now all checks are local. Uh, and so it's three days. But they also said to the Fed, you can make it any time shorter to the extent technology allows. And I think I've demonstrated to you technology has allowed that a long time ago. But here's the rub. The Fed, in addition to regulating all of America's payment system, operates a payment system. And their system is called the Automatic Clearinghouse, or ACH. It's the nation's largest payment system, but by no means is it you know, the dominant one, there's, a, there's the clearinghouse system, there are small payment authorities, there are regional payment authorities. I gave this talk to the New England uh, Regional Payment Authority, which I'm sure is an organization you guys all follow on Twitter. Um, and so like, there are a lot of little payment, but so the Fed is setting the rules for everybody, but they're also operating a system. And what have they not done with their system? What every other country did with their system. Modernize it. And they didn't want to pass a rule or regulation, even though they're required by law to make it as fast as it would keep up if it would mean shutting down their system. The feds had made this mistake in other areas before. In 1994, Congress passed the a law for the Fed requiring them to designate certain high-cost mortgages, subprime mortgages, as high-cost 
maybe predatory or be a little nervous, kind of like a warning stamp. It was called the Home Ownership Equity Protection Act, or HOIPA, HOPA. They were required in 1994 to do it, and they chose not to. They actually ended up doing it in 2007. How'd that work out in Nevada? You guys have any problems with subprime mortgages between 1994 and 2007? Right? The failure to regulate, even when Congress is required under law, has profound ramifications. And in this scenario, the Fed's failure to regulate has led to hundreds of billions of dollars being sucked out of people in that 25% who pay overdrafts, who pay payday loans, who go to check cashers. This is how much they're spending per year. And I decided to have a little fun with this audience because I wanted you guys to look at what billions look like. Because in Washington, billions are sometimes real money and sometimes they're not. But I think it's sometimes illustrative to appreciate how many zeros we're talking about. Right? Now I put some like some of these figures, right? The check cashers, you know, right, so Americans spend $60 billion a year in checks. Well, they cash nominal face value than their fees. The payday fees are actually much higher. Some people would argue Americans pay about $25 billion in fees. This is fees not looking at interest payments, other parts of the payday loan trap. So I don't want you to spend too much time some of the, the figures. But overdrafts are pretty interesting, huh? Now, what share of these would be solved by having real-time payments? This is a tricky problem, and I don't have that much data. Uh, I could tell you one-third based on the three people in line at the bank, maybe two-thirds, but it's not that. But here's a piece of information I do know. Wells Fargo decided to, to do something good for their customers. We can understand, maybe we all know why. But they decided to do something good and they created this thing called Operation Rewind, whereby they said if, your direct if you have an overdraft and your direct deposit hits within 24 hours of your overdraft, we're going to rewind and give you back your overdraft. One bank, one form of payment, direct deposit. Direct deposit is not instant. Let me just say that. When I first started working on this, I put out something on Facebook about this. And all these Facebook comments were like, oh, this is really interesting, but it doesn't apply to me because I have direct deposit. Oh, no. Direct deposit works through that ACH system often, which has a delay in it. The Fed has made a little bit of improvement on their ACH system. I'll give them a little bit of credit where it's due. They moved it to the same day if you get in by 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 10 a.m. out here. Uh, it is, I think, uh, 7 a.m. in Hawaii. So it's a, is it really same day? And let me explain a little bit without getting too technical. The ACH system works as a batch processing system. So think of your laundry machine. You put in a, a, a load of laundry. You hit the button, it spins through, it comes out, right? That's how they s s process all their payments. They get them all together, they sort it all out. Once that batch is closed, once the laundry door is closed and the thing starts, you can't open it. So you're shut out. You can't take a batch system and make it a real-time system. You just have to build another one. Anybody here have a CD player? Can you stream? Can you, can you put on Spotify? Right? Who here who has an A-track? There's some technology that you just can't you know, psych, I, I, I've seen people who can like figure out a way to plug their phone into their car with a cassette or all these crazy things. Some things you can jerry-rig, this you can't. You have to build a new system. All those other countries did, right? Trust me, England was processing payments long before America existed, and they decided to modernize in, in 2008. So Wells, go back to Wells Fargo, right? One type of payment, only 24 hours. On an earnings call, they disclosed that this hit their bottom line. They lost $71 million in overdraft fee. One bank, one subset, $71 million from this. I think this is easily responsible for 20% of America's overdrafts. You want to say it's 30, you want to say it's 10, whatever. So what's 20% of overdrafts? $7 billion a year. Who pays overdrafts? The 50% of people who hit the zero lower bound of their bank account. $7 billion a year. Okay, well what if we'd done this 12 years ago when, oh, I don't know, England did it. I'm not going to go back that much further. A bunch of other countries did, right? But 12, 7 billion a year, that's $100 billion almost. 84 if you want to be exact. Uh, but I'll, when we get it later. The Fed today has promised that they're going to institute real-time payments. They rolled out a big thing in August. Uh, in part because a lot of pressure was being generated, and I'll get into a little bit of that story. Um, 
And they said, don't worry, we're going to modernize our ACH system to catch up with these people. We're going to call it FedNow, and it's going to come out in 2024. Problem solved! Right? Well, here's what I know for a fact. Friday was August 30th. There are going to be a lot more of those days between now and 2024, number one. We can't afford to wait. Number two, here's something else I, uh, I, I, I know, which is, which is that there's no reason to. Right? Here's the solution. Make real-time payments required now. Remember that 1987 law I told you about? There's an effort in Congress to, um, to change it, to strike three days and just say real time. And you have to make it available right now. And that's been introduced by Senators Van Hollen from Maryland, yay Maryland, and Senator Warren of Massachusetts. I'm a Marylander. That's a lot of state pride, America's 42nd largest state. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, many of you may be familiar with her from Massachusetts. Congresswoman Presley in the House and Congressman Garcia have introduced this bill. It would require the Fed to build a system, but it would solve this conflict that they have about being a regulator and an operator. If their bill were signed into law, the real, your payment would be available immediately. It would solve the problem for next Friday. Now, how would the banks make it work? The banks would have two options. Option one, use the real-time payment thing that a group of private banks in the clearinghouse have built that actually works right now and is operational. Right? You can guess why a lot of banks, particularly small community banks, have been fighting this system and don't want to join. Right? Remember that earnings call I mentioned? 71 million? That $34 billion is pure profit. Who wants to be the CEO that reduces profits? But to their credit, I think there was a little bit of understanding within some of the banks invested in the real-time payment technology that they don't want to be a taxicab medallion holder in an Uberized world. Because here's something else to know about payments. We think of payments as part of the banking system because they are. They don't have to be. Banks and commerce are separated in America and they've been legally separated for a long time. Let me ask you guys a question. What's Mitsubishi? One of the 20 largest banks in the world. The cars are just something they make in one of their little conglomerates because Japan does not separate banking and commerce. <coughs> we do. And the definition of being a bank is having a bank holding company and without boring you with legalese, it's taking of deposits and making loans. That's what makes you a bank. And payments are just make a lot of sense to be in the banking industry. They're networked, they're regulated, they, they have all these access to um, uh, Federal Reserve and different systems, and it's convenient and all the rest of this stuff. But it doesn't have to be. Who here has been to China? Yeah? When you're in China, it's crazy. A few years, they have almost no credit card readers. In the entire country, they have 20 million credit card readers and 7 billion debit cards. Uh, they don't use credit cards. They don't use debit cards. They use these things called Alipay and WeChat Pay, which both have over a billion monthly users each. And there are apps on your phone with a little QR code that either they scan or you scan, and then the money goes from your digital wallet. Anybody here have PayPal or Venmo? It's a college or right here's a Venmo crowd. Um, you know, you can save money up there in a digital wallet or it can pull from your bank account. There they just put it in their bank account. And it just transmits. No fee. There can be a fee to downstream it to your bank. Ant Financial, which is the parent of Ali. Alipay is part of Alibaba, which is like Chinese Amazon. WeChat is like Chinese Facebook. And by the way, there's been a lot, I don't know if you guys heard about Facebook's idea of creating this digital currency, Libra. A lot of people think it's about Bitcoin or challenging the payment. To me, it's inspired completely by WeChat Pay because of the data that you see in the payment flow and the ease of providing these things. And Facebook is a global company. And remember that third thing that I mentioned up there? The, the 20 to 25% check cashing, payday loans, and wire transmitter. That's the sending of remittances. 30 to $50 billion a year sent by people in the United States, mostly to family um, from immigrants. immigrants. That's what they're trying to compete with. That whole Western Union thing, that's a whole other ripoff scheme. We tried to address some of that in Dodd-Frank. There's a lot more you can go. That's what they're trying to disrupt. And the banks see that coming. And they don't want to lose it. And so they weren't going to wait for Fed now in 2024. And by the way, show of hands, if the government or a private business, if a contractor, if anybody told you they were going to build you something in five years, how many of you think it'll be ready on time? Anyone in this room? 
I don't. There we go. I've never, I've never seen a contract. Oh, it's a two-month project. Don't worry about it. Day 61, <laughs> they're hard hats, right? Um, so option number one, use this existing system. Option number two, give them the money. It's their money. You can take the risk and wait for the two or three days. What's, why are you sitting on it for two to three days? Why just advance the funds? You're the bank. You have the money. Now, you say, oh my God, well, what about fraud? Okay, fraud's a thing. But the law only covers, and I didn't mention this early on, but it's important now in this part. The law covers the first $5,000 of your deposit and only for customers who've been with you for six months. So I'm not advocating for a, a worldview where I can randomly show up with a million dollars and ask for the money in a briefcase and you have to give it to me right away. Right? But I think $5,000 would cover the problem for people who are at zero. And six months, okay, I may not have solved the problem with this in every conceivable instance, but how many people here have had a bank account for more than six months? Right? Within that 20 to 25 percent. Uh, and so just advance the money. And the bank, by the way, under my proposal or the proposal advocated by the members of Congress, the bank can choose which of the two. If it's so concerned about the fraud risk, it can join this other payment thing. There is no reason for us not to have do, do this today. And if you did this today, you would make a real impact. And by the way, you join these other countries because the rest of the world is leapfrogging us. Let me get back to the Chinese story for a second. Because they've completely leapfrogged us with this technology. You go around China with a credit card, you can't use it. One of the things that we haven't fully appreciated and how America's economy leads to global dom dominance is a strong word. But you know, we invented a lot of this payment system. The credit card was actually invented as by diners in New York who didn't want to carry around cash for the weekend and restaurants who adopted it because they, they realized it was, people weren't showing up to buy things because they couldn't wait until they, they physically had run out of money and they didn't either want or carry checks, etc. And so, uh, but this card system has been universally adopted. You go anywhere in the world and you kind of have this expectation almost of any major city or modern economy that they'll take your card, right? There used to be a thing called traveler's checks, <laughs> right? When you weren't entirely sure about it. Uh, that's gone away because we have this global ATM network. This global, the Chinese system looks at you like you're on Mars. In part, they've, they've eliminated all of these expensive things in the middle. And they've just gone point to point. And if you stop and think about it, what if you got paid into your Amazon account? How much money do you spend on Amazon? What if Amazon was offering you discounts to keep money up there? How much of your monthly thing could, could you pay your gas bill on it? Could you pay this? Could you pay your cell phone? Kenya, which is a much smaller country and in my opinion has gotten a little more studying than it's worth relative to China's and the lack of attention uh, that it's gotten. Kenya has this thing with M-Pesa where everybody basically trades cell phone credits. Because ultimately payments like money are a thing we all agree on to accept as instruments and stores of, of, of value. It's a system of debits and credits with third party operability without prior party consent. That's like a long verbiage, but I'll deconstruct that for one second, which is like, if I give you 100 bucks, it doesn't matter where I got it from, it's now your $100. Right? I didn't have to consent with whoever gave it to me. That's what makes money money. That's different than if you and I have an agreement to go out to lunch and we take turns paying. I can't say, oh, I know it's my turn for you to take me to lunch, but can you take my friend Jane instead? Right? You're going, no, no, I don't consent to that. Who here has tried to have a friend bridge something between three people? Right? Prior party consent. Money doesn't have that possibility. Money can be a lot of different things. Technology is changing the role that banks play in this intermediary. And if we don't adopt our payment system, we could be the ones that are being left behind and outdated. Because by any reasonable expectation, we are way behind the curve. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take some questions. So does, does that 
also contribute to the inequality? Well, I mean, yes and no, right? It, 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 one, if you're paying interest, it means that you're running a negative balance, which is expensive. Most credit cards are high cost. But one of the reasons I think people run negative balances is they need to keep this cushion in their bank account because whatever you're paying in interest may suck, but $35 per overdraft sucks worse, right? And so it's a bit of this time mismanagement when you get around the zero lower bound. The 1% you're getting back, whether you're paying off their interest or you're using it to buy something, it's all the same. Money is fungible. So you're somewhere on that, on that train of it. But you're not, uh, you're, you're, if you're carrying a credit card balance, you're on this side of the ledger. These people aren't carrying a balance and paying interest. Questions? Uh, was there someone? Okay. Sir, and then uh, we'll get over. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. How, how do uh, smartphone costs to be able to use some of these improved systems compared to the overdraft and, uh, let's say, on the other side of the uh, you know, credit card and yeah. fully banked costs? So it's a really good question. So there's a few surveys on mobile banking, and here's some fascinating facts. Uh, and if I was teaching econometrics at UNLV, I would actually use this as a case study for what I call omitted variable bias. So smartphone adoption to use mobile banking is higher among minorities than whites. I will repeat that because in my career, the number of things where access to banking and use of the financial system is higher among minorities than whites is one, and it's smartphone mobile banking. It's the only thing I've seen. We think that's really positive. I'm glad it's had greater bread. Anybody want to know what the omitted variable is? Age. Age is highly correlated with this, and minorities are younger than whites. That's why. It's basically when you control for age, it goes away, but adoption is very high. Here's what's really interesting about the mobile adoption. If I only know what you do, I basically know how much money you have. The people use these radically different. Lower income people use it to check their balance. Higher income people use it to move money. If you're moving money, you have money. If you're using this to check your balance, you're, you're, you're trying to avoid that zero lower bound where the life gets really expensive really fast. Now, you asked a question that I think kind of said, well, what about data? Don't assume that data is free, particularly on the lower bound, and you are correct. That's actually the next step of my research is to start looking at certain things about access that are having consequences among lower income communities. One area that's come to my attention is this thing about getting data shut off or the cost of data to access it. That all being said, it's ultimately a great equalizer because the branch hour doesn't matter, the branch location doesn't matter, right? Anybody can, can do that. And it unlocks a world of other low cost options. It also unlocks a world of high cost options. And there's some predatory natures and concerns about that. But I have a lot of confidence on this. It also is an interconnected wire system in which we all have accounts and access to move electronic information. That's what the banking system, one of its comparative advantages in payments has been a networked system that can move not only money but information. Because a payment is really not just moving money, it's also information. How much are you paying? What is the purpose for? There's a lot of data that goes when you pay something, right? It's not like you, you, you pay 50 bucks to the gas company uh, or, or you know, to the energy company and it's just $50 magically appears in the account, right? They need to know your name, your account, which bill you're paying, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff goes through. So there's a, it, it's also a, a threat to migrate the payment system away from banking. It's a little bit mixed in both ways. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amortized loans, uh, for example, home loans or car loans, over the course of a 30-year loan, 3.5% FHA, you pay like 50% in interest, like $150,000 towards your house or more. Do you expect another crash coming soon? Or is there any possibility for reform with that in policy? So I don't expect another crash coming uh, in mortgages. Uh, I think financial crises have a lot of things in common. Uh, one is you need 
leverage which lending provides. You can have speculation in a bubble without a financial crisis if you don't have leverage. Those of you who remember the dot-com bubble, pets.com stock became net, all these stocks went way up in value and then way down, but there wasn't leverage. Why wasn't there leverage? Because we had a margin requirement that said you, you had to put up at least half your money and a culture that doesn't borrow that much to bet on the stock market, right? That, that regulation that was never gutted from the Great Depression helped prevent the dot-com bubble from being a cr uh, crisis or panic. Uh, Bitcoin is another example of something that had a bubble. As it relates on the, on the lending part and the cost of interest, it's very expensive. There's an app, uh, I'll give a little plug for, for um, EarnUp, which is an, an app uh, um, that, that talks about ways to prepay things as a, as a more attractive saving mechanism for people. It also does some financial management. You could take a look on it. Um, that being said, in order to get a, a, a home loan, and I'm going to distinguish between home and car, I think there's a problem in car. Uh, particularly in subprime auto, which could create a, a bigger problem. Um, but in home loans, it's really the way to build wealth because of leverage. You mentioned 3.5%, which is a down payment requirement. I'm going to use five because the math is easier. What would you rather do? Buy a home with 5% down that goes up 2% a year, or be invested in a stock market that goes up 8% per year? Which is, which is more profitable to you? Answer, the home. Why? Because the, what's going up is the gross value. Remember, I had $5,000, I bought a $100,000 home. It went up $2,000 in value, 2%. I made $2,000 on $5,000 investment. I made 40%. That's a lot better. The stock, because it's the only way for most people to get leverage on an, an a appreciating asset, now it depends on the price going up, that doesn't always happen. We all live through that. Stock market doesn't always go up either. Eventually, it'll come back down. Hopefully, it'll go back up again, just like in real estate. But um, that's very different than a depreciating asset like a car. Your car, I know your car is going to be worth less in 10 years. So those types of assets are very different on the individual scale. Do I have time for one more? We do, if there is one. Who has the best question? All right, Peter? Yeah, what's something we should aim for, uh, credit points? Oh, you want, you, you, you know, it's interesting. I got this question. I also got this question. I wrote one of my pieces for NBC News on a free flight headed to a free hotel. Remember I told you I was a Marriott and Southwest guy? And uh, one reporter asked me afterwards, he said, do you feel guilty profiting? I mean, you've just described in what I hope is a convincing manner the gross income inequality driven by this payment system and why, if you're interested in tackling income inequality as a defining goal of policy goal facing us today, you should care about something as weird as the payment system. Do you feel guilty that you yourself are benefiting from it? Kind of a corollary to your earlier question. And I said no. I said I'm doing my work to help the public. I'm championing this. I'm fighting for it. I want to change it. But like it is the system. Uh, the answer to your question is highly personalized. It depends what you want. It depends how much money you're going to spend, right? There are different things that get unlocked. It depends. At, at, for younger people, the single most important thing is not to be in debt, to build up a good constant credit. Don't skip a payment or miss a late thing, not just the late fee, but your credit reporting system. In another time, I could tell you why the credit reporting system is totally outdated and a horrific uh, uh, way, in my opinion, to allocate credit, and there's a much better, cheaper, cheaper, fairer way to do it. But that's a lecture for another day. Thank you. Man. Thank you. We've written that down. That will be lecture number two. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us uh, and for your questions. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, hope you can join us. We'll have our colleague Molly Reynolds out from Brookings. Molly's an expert on the operations of the U.S. Congress. And so she, we'll be taking a look at the, the Congress and the executive branch. Both have been in the news a little bit lately. Uh, it should be another timely and interesting lecture. So I hope we see you all then. Thanks for coming.